Florida. Okay. All right. He did mention that a while ago. I've been trying to call him and not getting him. That explains it. Okay. At our Wednesday uh, dry run, he indicated he was going to Florida for a short, short trip, though. I don't think it was going to be very long. He's got the sister. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Happy New Year, all, and welcome to the meeting of the Inland Wetlands Agency and the Conservation Commission. It's a virtual virtual meeting. Um, has any, is there any public waiting for the public participation portion of the meeting? Thanks. Okay. Right. Are you people still hearing me? Because I seem to be graying out here. I can yeah, hear you. We don't have an image, but we can hear you, Jack. Okay. Um. Uh, I can hear you too, but for some reason the video seems to be um, saying it's WebEx service not responding. You look frozen. Yeah, I'm frozen. A little image just came up that said due to low bandwidth, the video wouldn't be available. Uh, little... Frontiers being wonderful for me again, huh? Yeah, that's that's the explanation. There's there's a little triangular symbol on you, and that's what comes up when you hover over it. it the video will resume automatically when when anyway. Okay. <laughs> so that's our technical introduction. All right, we're on to permit extensions, which I believe we have none. Correspondence and reports. We have none at the moment. And bonds, we have none. The host has come on. Okay. All right. Discussion on the minutes, which we received with our packets. Minutes of the December 15th meeting. Anybody have any? I didn't, couldn't tell who said that. I said you look, you look good. Okay. They look good to me. I don't see any corrections. All right. Then no one else has any corrections? Or should we, with this virtual format, just anyone with a thumbs up? <laughs> If you are concur and we'll have an approval by consensus if we get all the. And Jack, we'd need a word from you. <laughs> we may have lost Jack. We've lost Jack. We still have a quorum. All right. So the, the minutes are approved by consensus. We'll hope we get Jack back. Okay. All right, without Jeff, we don't have conservation commission <clears throat> or wetland officer report. So we are on to the new business, which is application 22-02P for Hartford truck equipment. Do we have someone here to speak to that? Well, I'm sure it's Peter DeMalley, and then he can let us know who else should be on for this one. All right, let me see. Peter? Unmute. I guess we should be on. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for uh, adding us to your agenda tonight. Uh, Peter Alter, Attorney Peter Alter, is going to be starting off the presentation if he can be admitted. 
Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure who on the list should be admitted. And then there was one other name. I wasn't sure if it was for this application. Glenn Martin uh, will be, uh, we're here in my office and Glenn Martin is going to be with me here. So he does not need to be admitted if he's on the list. Uh, but Peter Alter does. Um, Derek and Blake Brannon are going to be uh, most likely uh, observing, uh, probably not participating, but if they could be admitted in the event they need to participate, that'd be wonderful. But they'll, I'm sure I'm sure they'll be re I, I'm sure they'll remain on mute. Really? Uh, could you go get Ben? Okay. Okay. Can you go get Ben? Somebody has to call in. We have to call in downstairs. Oh, he may have to call in? Yeah, if it's the camera not for it. All right. I'm going to call Peter Alter and ask him just to call in because his camera is obviously an issue. Oh, you want to try that? Can you hear me? This is Peter Alter speaking. Wonderful. Success. Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Alter. Great. Uh, believe me, it's no great loss that you can't see me. So <laughs> I will tell you I have a tie and jacket on, though, just so you know that I'm formally dressed as at least as well as Mr. Damali is. Um, we will hear from, from Glenn in, in a moment as our landscape architect, but I did want to give the commission a little background. Um, if you could put the first slide up, I think that would help, Glenn. Okay, Peter. Thank you. Trying to share my screen, but um, yeah, you oh, have to ask. Okay. Oh, he's got it now. Okay. Okay. Can you see the screen now? That's fine. I can see it. Um, yes. Hopefully, everybody yes. can. Good. Uh, both uh, our firm and design professionals represent uh, Derek and Blake Brannon, who are. Uh, the owners of the property that you see outlined um, with King Street uh, to the top of the uh, image. And their business is Hartford Truck Equipment, which you see uh, on John Fitch Boulevard, just to the east. North on this map is to the right, to get everybody oriented. Um, and. The uh, Derek and, and Blake Brannon have uh, been running the Hartford truck equipment business and uh, that business uh, has continued to grow on John Fitch Boulevard and continued to uh, expand its business. And as part of that expansion, um, they have the need for additional facilities. The property that's outlined um, mostly in green is about 11.4 acres in total has frontage all the way out to John Fitch Boulevard but the subject of the proposals that we're currently presenting to the town only involved that area that's outlined in the red hatched line uh, that you're seeing outlined by cursor now that portion of this property is zoned rural residence the balance of the property is a uh, general commercial zone uh, out to John Fitch Boulevard. We have filed an application with the Planning and Zoning Commission to change the zone on the balance of the property to a general commercial zone. And Blake and Derek are very, very sensitive to and have uh, taken great time and effort in addressing the needs and expectations of the people who live in the residences along King Street. This is obviously a transition area. We have commercial industrial properties on McGuire Road, and we have some also on Burnham Street, but immediately um, 
to the west on King Street is is very much an established residential neighborhood. Blake and Derek do not want to have a negative impact on that neighborhood. They have spent a great deal of time, effort, and money in speaking to and addressing the needs expressed by many of the residents on King Street, which leads us to uh, the proposal that you see tonight uh, acting as a conservation commission only. There is no wetlands activity. There are no wetlands on the site. You have uh, part of the materials that you have tonight is a report from Ian Cole. Uh, Mr. Cole did uh, a reconnaissance of the entire site and has rendered his opinion that there are no wetlands uh, anywhere on this property. So that we are only asking uh, that you act as a conservation commission this evening. Our proposal, as Glenn Martin will will go into detail in a moment on, is to create a berm all along the residential area on King Street. Uh, that will be a heavily landscape berm. It will also have a six to eight foot uh, fence on the top of it uh, as well to further screen the residential properties from the commercial properties that go all the way out to John Pitch Boulevard. We have already uh, presented for consideration to the Planning and Zoning Commission a permanent private conservation easement that will encumber 3.3 acres of the parcel for which we seek the zone change. Um, and that will be a permanent buffer to be established uh, in its relationship to King Street. In addition to that, there currently is a driveway that connects King Street through this property to the commercial properties on McGuire Road. That driveway, uh, as it serves the commercial properties, will be abandoned. Uh, we are leaving partial, a portion of that driveway in place as an accommodation to the residential neighbor to the north who makes use of it to access the rear of his property. But beyond his property, uh, that driveway will cease to exist. Mr. Sunderland, who is uh, owner of property on McGuire Road and who has rights to utilize that driveway, has graciously agreed to release those rights uh, in response to a request from uh, Blake and Derek Brannon. Uh, he's agreed to uh, give up his rights to that driveway so that it can be extinguished. Um, everything that the, the Brannon brothers has, have done is designed to reassure the neighbors on King Street that we mean not to intrude into their residential neighborhood in any way. And so the site plan that you have before you is for the development of this screening, permanent screening and vegetation uh, to create that privacy and to create a real separation between the residential uses on King Street and the commercial uses that are related to John Fitch Boulevard Route 5. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask Glenn to walk you through his design, uh, design professional's design of the berm and how it relates to this property as well as uh, King Street residential properties. So with that, I'll turn it over to Glenn. Thank you, Peter. I'll move to the next slide. This is Peter Mitch. I'm a landscape architect with design professionals. And here is a more clear view of our proposed berm. The proposed berm will begin here, extend all the way down to this area right here. Uh, the easement will include an eight foot high earthen berm. The berm is, a, is, is approximately 1140 feet long with a three to one slope. A six to eight foot high chain, chain link fence with privacy slats is proposed on top of the berm, running all along top of the berm. The fence will provide screening and security for the property. Evergreen trees will also be planted on both sides of the berm, to provide additional screening of the property from King Street and the adjacent properties. So we'll have three rows of evergreens along the entire berm and two rows of evergreens along this area here. The larger and best specimen existing trees along King Street will remain 
help provide additional screening. These trees have been tagged and by the Director of Public Works and will be protected. So in this area, trees have been tagged, those will be saved, um, providing some additional screening. The dense brush and basin species will be removed in the same area along King Street and the area maintained to be attractive for the neighborhood. The evergreen trees on the proposed berm will include a mixture of spur, uh, spruce, fir, and white pines. The white pines are proposed in the center of the planting, plantings. So running down the center of the berm will have white pines along the whole length of the berm. They will grow quickly to provide a dense green. The firs and spruces will be planted on both sides of the white pines. Their dense branches will further enhance the planting screen. The trees will provide screening for the property and also provide wildlife habitat. The white pines, when they get large, can provide nesting habitat for hawks. And the fir and spruce can also provide shelter and nesting habitat for other birds and other wildlife. The evergreens will also provide a food source for wildlife. For example, birds and squirrels can feed on the balsam fir and white spruce seeds. Also, our client will be maintaining the berm plantings and caring for the trees on a regular basis. Next, I'd like to move to uh, our section views of the berm. Uh, this this uh, view here shows the evergreen plantings after five years of growth, and you can see how they will help shield the rear of the property along with the berm, the eight foot high berm, to uh, provide a nice screen of the rear of the property. Um, you can also see a proposed storage building at, uh, in the property, which is uh, planned for the future. Not at this time, but that will be a future addition at some point. And these lower sections, cross section two and three, show the nearest uh, adjacent uh, homeowner building, which is 510 King Street, and the relationship to the berm. Um, this, the berm and the screens will help, again, shield the rear of the property. The next slide shows the evergreen screen um, at full maturity when the spruce trees and the, the white pines grow to their eventual full size. So there'll be an effective screen in the long term. The next slide is the uh, grading plan and the ENS plan. The grading plan and ES plan files best practices of the latest state of Connecticut guidelines for soil erosion and sedimentation control. Proposed infr infiltration basin design was based on web soil survey infiltration rates for this soil type. And inf infiltration basin in this is in this area right here at the base of the berm. Daniel Jameson, professional engineer, is here tonight. If you have any questions on the basin design. Also, we'll have silt fence at the base of the uh, berm along King Street and wrapping around here. And also inlet protection for the basins along King Street. And all disturbed areas that do not have tree or shrub plantings will be seeded to lawn. And at this point, are there any questions on the, on the berm or the berm plantings? I, I just have one and that is, what will you be constructing the berm of? Type of soil. It hasn't and, been. Yeah, and do you been think? Point. And oh, the sorry. point of that, the point of that is, do you feel like it will provide enough stability for those trees at maturity to to hold? Oh yes. To hold them against wind throw and everything. Oh like, yes, we'll we'll make sure that the design of the berm is sufficient to be stable in the long term. So yes, definitely. Yeah, we'll. We'll make sure of that. Native soils. Native soils. And I, will, will you or Mr. J, I mean, Mr. Jamison address the ENS measures on the plan or? Yeah, he, he can talk about it. Oh, sure, yes. That's Mrs. Yeah. Kelly. Thanks. Put it on the PowerPoint. Hello, Ms. Kelly. 
For the record, Daniel Jameson, professional engineer, state of Connecticut, and project manager, design professionals. Um, for ENS measures, um, we're uh, proposing uh, silt fence of downhill portion of the berm um, to collect any chance of um, contaminated runoff from uh, encroaching into King Street and onto the adjacent property owners. Uh, we'll also have like temporary stockpile areas proposed and um, just kind of uh, showing that the, to protect our infiltration basin area um, from um, big heavy equipment driving through that area so that we can ensure that it um, infiltrates. Uh, we're proposing construction access off of King Street here and then um, tree protection measures for those existing trees to remain as Glenn had uh, indicated and also standard um, catch basin inlet protection for the catch basins along um, King Street. And as Glenn mentioned, all, all um, ENS measures proposed were done so um, in accordance with the 2002 Connecticut Erosion and Sedimentation Control Guidelines. We can, we can, well, we are, we have just an 11 by 17 copy. Oh, um, I can, I can make out the construction entrance, the inlet protection, the silt fence. I don't, and it may not be on this page. Our notes about the seating, the permanent seating, um, I believe somewhere in the plan. Yeah, I, think, oh, I think it is there as well, Daniel. Oh, it is here? Yeah. And it could just be where I too little to read. Over here. Be a fescue seed. Be a fescue seed. And I mean, for a temporary seeding, it will ensure that any exposed areas would be treated. Um, seven days as required for the 2002 Connecticut guidelines. And um, if winter winterization is needed, uh, they'll add a tack of fire to that to ensure that it um, is held onto the um, soil on um, if there, are, if there was a rain event that it could, it could hold onto the, the tack of fire with a system allowing everything to bind to the soil. Okay, and, and usually that's, that's in the notes and is there, there must be another page with those notes yeah, we have an erosion and sedimentation control, the sequence uh, notes, which would be on a different page, uh, not on this sheet, but it is in the plan set. Daniel, there's a notes page on C-LS2. I don't know if you have that as part of this yeah, set to present. It, it wasn't, okay. And there so go. there, okay. So there's where you're addressing. If you could just hone in, there's your seating notes. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Uh, Barbara, question. Yes. Um, in building this berm, are you planning on, you know, working on the whole 1,100 feet all at once, or are you going to start at one end and sequentially work around so that you can be stabilizing it behind you? We're going to do lift. Yeah, I would say they'll start at one end and work so that they don't um, leave too much exposed. But of course, uh, providing the proper compaction would be um, the, one, one of the focuses as well, so that we can make sure that the uh, berm is fit to hold those trees, as uh, Glenn was discussing, uh, through maturity. Okay. So would, uh, limit the construction activity so that they don't leave uh, more work exposed than what they could provide temporary uh, protection for um, before a major a storm event or something would come to cause a problem. Okay, thank you. No problem, Mr. Phillips. All right. Any other questions from the commission? Is there any further presentation from the applicant? Hey, Barb, Barb, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I, was, I was out at the site today looking at it, and it looks to me like they've already pre-positioned a lot of the material to make this berm. I guess my question is, what is the soil type that they're proposing to use? Um, I mean, it looks like it looks like you've got a, a lot. I don't know if it's enough to do the whole project, but it, you've got a, quite a bit already. We can address that. I, I think that 
uh, the commissioner is referring to the temporary berm that right. was created uh, with respect to screening uh, parking area for vehicles through uh, planning and zoning approval that we secured several months ago. That is not the material that will be used to construct this berm. That that material is uh, wood chip uh, material that was secured from a landscape contractor to create a temporary berm. Uh, the permanent berm will not be utilizing that material for its for its basis. Um, it, I think that's the only material currently on site. Is that correct, Peter? That is that is correct. Um, yeah, it's about a 12 foot high temporary berm um, comprised of wood, strips of wood um, that uh, Billy Mitchell installed um, to, just to screen the temporary parking area uh, before we were able to secure our zone change and, and other site plan approvals from the Plain Zoning Commission. On an interim basis, it was, as Peter Alter knows, uh, and he did the presentation on that, it's, it's just a two year temporary and conditional permit. That's a temporary measure though. So there, there is no there is no uh, uh, stockpiles of material on site. Um, the soil will either be excavated on site or brought in from off site. But it'll be native material from the general area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And depending on how much in and out that the construction entrance may require regular maintenance, but I know that's covered in the ENS. Yep. In the yeah, there are notes to that effect. Yep. All right. Oh, Peter, or Mr. Jamal, is there any further presentation? Uh, Mr. Alter? Uh, the only other matter I'd make, or, or just to emphasize, um, I think I did the math, and the proposal contemplates about 157 new trees on this berm. Uh, to say that the Brannons have, have gone the extra mile to create an appropriate screen for their residential neighbors is, is I think a very fair statement for them. Uh, the outreach that they went through uh, in order to uh, help the neighbors feel confident, um, I think is significant. And the fact that they're willing to encumber 3.3 acres of their property with a permanent private conservation easement, I think is uh, appropriate and, and uh, would be something that the Conservation Commission um, is familiar with and, and hopefully will appreciate. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you for that comment. Okay. Any further comments from the commission? I have one comment, Barb. Yeah, I, I've, I noticed that some of the berms that they did over by Orchard Hill School, planting trees on top of them, it, you know, as you would expect is that, you know, if you built, you put a tree on top of a hill, you know, it, the, the, it's probably starved for water. So they're going to have to maintain some kind of, you know, regimented way of getting those trees established or they're going to lose them. That's my only comment. Thank you. And and I do notice that there are notes on the easement to allow for the maintenance, you know, of the plantings and things. So I think that's a good point to note. And I, and I know Jeff is not here. We spoke briefly um, when the application first came in, you know, and I don't believe he had further comments. I guess so here I, I can wear my CPESC hat to say um, that the ENS measures as as presented, you know, are appropriate, you know, for for their intended use on the site. So they should be they, you know, if they're installed and maintained properly, they should they should be adequate to do the job of containing. You know, the other caution just just I would have is, is I think it was a good point about utilizing tackifier if there's going to be bare soil for any period of time. And I know the guidelines call for 30 days, but particularly given the sensitivity of the residential area and the surrounding commercial, 
if you're leaving bare soil for longer than that. I mean, that, that's a long period of time to leave it that you really might want to consider the temporary or permanent stabilization much sooner than that. There we go. Okay. So, would anyone care to make a motion on this application? Okay. Move to approve application. What is the number on it? 22-02P. Um, standard terms and conditions. Uh, Barb, did Jeff say anything about um, bonding, recommended bonding when you talked with him on this? Oh, no. No, he did not. Okay, because I think we should have bonding for both the uh, ENS and for the planting. Uh, would you have a recommended amount or? Okay, then we should look at the, the square foot of that or? Madam Chairman, we would I'd ask Mr. Certainly we could um, leave that to uh, Jeff to make a recommendation and carry it forward to the Planning and Zoning Commission if you would indicate that a bond should be set in an amount to be determined by Mr. Folger, that would be uh, acceptable to us. Okay, so then bonding to be determined in, uh, and approved by town staff. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, the alternative to that. And that should also include, well, since it would be bonding for both the NS and planning, it would include uh, information as to how long that should be held to assure the planting is still good. There, there should be separate bonds for the two, a separate bond for the infiltration and planting, which is typically three growing seasons. Yes. Okay. The okay, ENS bond is till, until the site is stable. <clears throat> yeah. Did, do any other commissioners have other conditions they think should be placed upon this. Good. I guess not. I guess then we need a second. I second it. And was that okay? Thank you, John. I thought that was your voice. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any any discussion? So I would this say that Dick made about the plantings at the school. I think that's a valid point. And so what time period are we looking at to make sure that those are, in, you know, thriving and in place? Normally it's uh, three growing seasons would be held to assure the establishment of the plantings. And, and P and Z, I would think is, is gonna look at the landscape plans and look for, look for bonding. We probably are bonding the ENS and the infiltration basin. Okay. In so the context of our. At PNZ, we'll be bonding the uh, the plantings. Or at okay. least we should. We can make sure of that. I would think. Yeah. Should not we make that <clears throat> part of what we're asking for whether it's done now or by planning and zoning well since we have it as planning and as bonding to be uh, established by staff uh jeff would be able to obviously work with um staff with planning and zoning to make sure that one group or the other is bonding the plantings Sounds good. I mean, if, if not, I could, I'll take a guess, well, not a guess, but an estimate. <clears throat> I think it's best, I, I think it's best to just be consistent with other bonds that are set. And I know there's a calculated rate that he, he uses to set them. 
which we had talked about this more in preliminary terms. And I, so I think the final number should, should rest with it. Agree. Any further discussion then? Nope. All in favor of the motion as presented to approve application 2202P? Aye. 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 Is anyone opposing? I hear no one opposing. And is anyone abstaining? I hear no one abstaining. Okay. And we have an application granted. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then we are on to old business. The modification request for application 21-36P. Mr. Damali, I guess you'll stay on for that or Okay. Um, good, good evening, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm here here on the, uh, the the Ben Wheeler channel, uh, but uh, my name is James Connor. Uh, I'm an attorney with Updike Kelly and Spellacy with an office address at 225 Asylum Street in Hartford. I represent UW Vintage Lane 2 LLC. Uh, this commission approved with conditions my client's application to conduct regulated activity on its premises at 25 and 5 uh, Talbot Lane and 475 and 551 Governors Highway at its meeting on November 3rd, 2021, as described and depicted in application number 2136P. Prior to its decision on the main findings with respect to the application, uh, this commission determined on a procedural vote that none of the persons filing petitions to intervene under section 22A19 of the Connecticut general statutes had met their burden to prove an unreasonable likelihood of unreason excuse me, a reasonable likelihood of unreasonable pollution of su such of the air, water, and other natural resources of the state as are within the commission's jurisdiction. Notice of the decision was given to the applicant and published in a legal notice in the journal inquirer. The appeal period passed 15 days after the publication of the legal notice without any appeal having been brought to the Superior Court with regard to any aspect of the commission's action. In addition, this commission submitted its report on its final decision to the Planning and Zoning Commission. At that time, the Planning and Zoning Commission had a site plan application before it that pursuant to section 8.3.G.1 of the general statutes required it to receive uh, uh, this uh, report before making its decision. The Planning and Zoning Commission denied that application without voting on a resolution stating a reason for the denial. Following the denial, my client prepared an alternative site plan that is materially different with respect to the vehicular circulation system it employs on the west side of the building. This alternative vehicle circulation pattern locks in the location of the building, the storm drainage system, at all places where soil materials will be disturbed uh, in, in any wetlands, water courses, or upland review area. The new site plan has slight differences in the placement of impervious paved surfaces, with the net change being a reduction in the amount of impervious surface. And again, no change either adding or eliminating any impervious surface in wetlands, water courses, or regulated uplands. <clears throat> The section of the general statutes that I just referred to as requiring the Planning and Zoning Commission to await the report of the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Agency before rendering its decision on a site plan showing activity regulated under the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Regulations, Section 8.3.G.1, also requires an applicant for such a site plan to file an application for a permit with the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Agency not later than the day it files its site plan application with the Planning and Zoning Commission. 
This statute requires the PZC to give due consideration to your report and to state on the record its reasons uh, for any terms and conditions it establishes for an approval that are not consistent with your decision. However, there is no provision of the statute that makes a decision or a report of an inland wetlands and water courses agency stale for purposes of being received by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Further, court decisions make clear that the statute can be satisfied by an earlier wetlands approval, even when, from the perspective of Planning or Zoning Commission, the applicant's plan is different. The Connecticut Appellate Court addressed this issue in Irwin versus Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town of Litchfield, uh, case cited in 1997. Uh, the site is 45 uh, Connecticut uh, Appellate 89. This case involved a subdivision and special exceptions where the developer first obtained wetlands approval, second, made an unsuccessful application to the Planning and Zoning Commission, and third, returned to the Planning and Zoning Commission with a different configuration of subdivision lots but respecting the Conservation Commission's conditions for buffers around wetlands and a single driveway wetlands crossing. In that case, a neighbor who intervened as a, as a defendant in the developer's appeal objected that the developer submitted a new subdivision plan where the lot lines were moved so that the two lots could be accessed by the common driveway, now both qualified as interior lots, thus making the use of the common driveway proper according to the, uh, the planning and zoning regulation. But the wetlands impact did not change. To quote from the, uh, from the case, with respect to the effect on the parcels wetlands, the applications were identical. The chairman of the Conservation Commission wrote in a letter to the chairman of the Zoning Commission that the plaintiff's new subdivision plan did not affect the previous approvals and permits. Thus, no new application was required. Uh, we agree with the plaintiff that given the circumstances, the letter from the Conservation Commission was adequate to satisfy the requirements of General Statute Sections 83C and 826. Uh, the two sections of Title VIII uh, of the statutes that the court refers to in that passage are the sections pertaining to special permits or exceptions and subdivision approvals, respectively, that are analogous to section uh, 83G1, uh, which is the section that, that we have been concerned with. In 2010, the appellate court followed its decision, its president Irwin, uh, in Vine versus Planning and Zoning Commission of the town of Wallingford, that's at uh, 122 Con App 112, with express reference to section 83G1 and site plan applications. This was a case where the applicant pursued and obtained its wetlands approval while working through conflicts between its original zoning plan, site plan, and the zoning regulations, ultimately resolving them by eliminating a proposed building. The court held uh, that Section 83G1 does not require any new application to or report by an inland wetlands and watercourses agency where the amendment of a site plan application after wetlands approval clearly did not increase wetlands impacts, even without any communication by the wetlands agency confirming that to be the case. My client's application is squarely within the holdings of Irwin and Vine. Uh, furthermore, your regulations contain a provision, section 7.6, prohibiting granting applications in which there are no significant changes from an application submitted less than one year previously. Although the applicant had submitted an application on December 20th to both this commission and the PZC, the application to this commission was withdrawn on January 4th in light of this regulation and discussions with the senior environmental planner indicating that it was his opinion as well as that of the chair and vice chair that the new plan did not differ in any significant way from the plans in which the November 3rd approval was based. Although it withdrew its new application, uh, in addition to confirming UW Vintage Lane 2's objective of complying with the requirements 
for proper sequencing of its inland wetlands and site plan applications. It also wishes to verify the new configuration of the site improvements to the commission to satisfy condition number eight of the approval given on November 3rd. That condition provides this approval is based on a specific design, size building, and specific arrangement of impervious surface areas as presented. If any changes are proposed to the site design, the applicant must come before this commission to verify that the changes do not alter the findings that were made on this application. Uh, with me this evening uh, is, uh, is Peter Damali of Design Professionals, Inc., who will be able to do a screen share in order uh, to highlight on the plans presented for the commission's consideration, the overall changes in the plan, the differences in impervious coverage, and the remoteness of those changes from any wetland, water course, or regulated upland area. Uh, Peter, turn the camera over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good evening once again. Uh, for the record, Peter Damale, President of Design Professionals. Uh, and I just have some very brief remarks, if I may. Uh, first of all, oh, good. So we're able to share the screen, the exhibit. Uh, I want to first, before I go into the exhibit, I just want to make three quick statements. First of all, that the wetlands disturbance areas are unchanged from the prior application that this commission approved. The wetlands mitigation area is unchanged and the stormwater drainage is unchanged from what you had previously approved. There are no new activities that are proposed within wetlands or within your 80 foot upland review area. Beyond the upland review area, we are adding a small amount of pavement that's 1,408 square feet to provide for access to an expanded truck queuing area with truck 30 trucks, as you can see in the cursor. Uh, and that's northerly of our access drive. And the access drive goes in east-west position, uh, connecting the site with Talbot Lane, which is the only access point for trucks. And that that additional pavement that we're providing to access that area for truck circulation is more than offset by expanding a landscaped island of 1,470 square feet. Uh, the impervious coverage percentage is mathematically unchanged, uh, even though we have a little bit more pervious than uh, we had before. We're going from 109 trailer spaces down to 59. Uh, other than the expanded island and new access point, changes are mostly striping with pavement. Uh, po the, uh, that's uh, striping on the pavement itself. The bottom line is there's no net change to the plan with respect to wetlands. And basically it's the same plan uh, as you had approved previously in the prior application. And that concludes my remarks. So I'll turn it back to Attorney Connor, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> um, our request this evening is that the commission verify that the revised plans do not alter the findings that it made in its November 3rd decision and that the applicant is in compliance with condition eight uh, of that decision. Uh, in addition, the applicant asks that a communication be made to the Planning and Zoning Commission that its report of its November 3rd decision stands with equal force with regard to the revised plan. The applicant's letter of January 4th, asking to have this matter placed on the commission's agenda, uh, which uh, should be in, in your packet, uh, more specifically requests, one, a finding that the commission has verified that these changes to the site design do not alter the findings that were made in approving the permit pursuant to application 2136P, subject, however, to the continuing requirement that any further changes be brought before the commission in accordance with condition eight of the permit approved on November 3rd, 2021. And two, uh, to, to direct uh, the, the chairman or the senior environmental planner to advise the South Windsor Planning and Zoning Commission in writing that the report and final decision of the Inland Wetlands and Water Person Agency Conservation Commission with respect to application 2136P on November 3rd, 2021, also constitutes its report 
and final decision for purposes of section 8.3 G1 of the Connecticut General Statutes for activities regulated under the Illinois Wetlands and Watercourses Act involved in the new site plan application submitted to the Planning and Zoning Commission on December 20th, 2021. <coughs> we thank the commission for its, its time and attention with regard to this application and we'll be uh, happy to answer any questions about the plan. Thank you. Are there any any questions from the commission? Comments? Yeah. No, I, it, it, if the impervious coverage isn't changing, I imagine all the stormwater analysis and all that is going to stay the same. That's correct. There's, oh. yeah, that's, that's correct. There's, there have been no, uh, no changes uh, uh, in that regard to the uh, uh, stormwater management report that's uh, been submitted to the Planning and Zoning Commission. I guess you, you heard it. To, this is really to the commission, the reference in terms of how to handle this, um, the environmental, senior environmental plan or West consulting with me and, and with the vice chair, you know, as, as to how to get this onto our agenda and what the correct approach would be. And, and this is this is how we thought that we would handle it. Um, so we need we need to hear from the commission about whether or not we feel like the changes really, which is a looks like a net reduction of 62 square feet of impervious surface in any way alters our findings on that original application. Yeah. Um, Barb, I would suggest that we make a motion of a finding and then we can discuss it, discuss the motion and vote on it. Okay. So I'm move a finding. To do that. Okay, thanks. Move a finding that the proposed modifications does not change the conclusion of the impacts on wetlands and watercourses of the approval of application 21-36P. Clear and simple, good. Then we need second a second that. to- I'll All second. right, and, and Adam seconded it, okay. okay. And then we'll discuss, now discuss this. So well, there was a lot of legal uh, court precedent cases that were um, you know, talked about. And, you know, honestly, just from my perspective, I, I would actually like to just take a look at that. I mean, granted, this didn't change um, from what was originally, but I do expect to be some pushback. I could be wrong about that. And I just, I would feel better. I don't know about the other commissioners, but I would feel better to have some of that information that the attorney had presented to us verbally just to take a look at it um, um, before, you know, moving forward with this. I don't know how everybody else feels. I, I heard, I heard the attorney asking that we refer to Section Eight Three G One and so forth. Um, in, in our communications, I I feel like that wouldn't be an appropriate thing for us to, to cite that kind of precedence and everything. I think what we should be dealing with was the application that came before us that we acted on and that the proposed changes here and that we should be dealing with that, dealing with any continuing conditions if we want our conditions to remain in effect and then appropriate communication. Um, I, I, I don't think I don't, I, I would, I would not feel like without, like you're saying, without further analysis or without input from our own attorney, are we going to throw around um, references to court cases and what makes what valid or allowable? We were comfortable with this. We made a decision. We have a request for this minor modification and our, our number eight said that we should take a look at to see if it's substantial enough that that we would want to hear a new application. And I think that's the parameters within which we should act. 
I mean, I'm speaking there as my opinion. Um, I don't know if someone else wants to weigh in on that. Yeah, this isn't the first time we've seen modifications come in. And we've voted on the modifications in the past. Um, and there's no reason why we can't decide again whether the modification would is significant enough to warrant a new application, you know, voiding out the old permit and going for a new application, or whether it is just done. Um, in most cases, if we had not put condition eight in the um, initial permit approval, this probably would have been handled strictly as a change order in the field because it doesn't have significant impact on any of the conclusions or any of the um, material that was presented um, during the application process. I feel I feel like, you know, we speak to the validity of our decision and convey what that is. I feel like a lot of the legal decisions related really to planning and zoning and to whether or not they could rely on on what was done. So I I I agree that this is to answer a condition we put on the order or on the original approval and that we should speak mm -hmm. to that. Rick, did you have something? You're up on the screen. Uh, yeah, I was just looking at our regs, our 7.6 reg. They kind of, you know, is is kind of like doing normal business. You, you design something, and, and I bet you if you looked at every plan that came before us, there was probably something that was changed. And, the, you know, the, the word we use is, is it significant or not? You know, and I, I just can't help but think that this is, uh, something that addresses um, uh, uh, a, a truck parking idling issue. It has really no impact to any of our our metrics that we use. You know what? You know what? Wetlands, what upland review area? We're concerned with with all the you know stormwater management, and you know they seem to have been able to make the changes with with minimal impact or no impact and the impervious coverage increase they seem to cover with uh, a, a, a grass strip that kind of negated that so i i'm of the opinion this is you know an insignificant change and you know we'd go around forever you know in the business you know if we, if every time there was a small change we we would have to go back and revisit it i mean stuff happens when you're developing property you know, especially since we always lead the ball as far as getting approvals. You know, I'm planning and zoning gets our our take and they make their changes. I, I know that they make changes that we wouldn't have gone along with, but it's done. You know, a lot of times they add sidewalks, they take additional stuff away from us. And it just, it's the way it's done. You know, it's, it's got to be, t it's got to be significant. And I don't see anything that they're doing is making any significant change or anything you could point to that say, hey, you know, our reason for accepting this application has changed. I, I don't see that. And, you know, we got to keep a reasonable, you know, we can't. People develop property. They, they need some kind of way of moving along on these projects, you know, and if it's not a significant change, and it, it, there's no, if anything, it's better. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's to me, seems, seems the spirit of 7.6 in our regs. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say I agree with Dick. I don't see anything significant here to make us go backwards. I think Dick um, summarized that very, very nicely. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Dick, I agree with that statement in its entirety. Well, uh, well, well put, well spoken. And Art, Art, 
Do you, do you want to come in on the change itself, aside from the concern of any of the legal references? No, I, I think the discussion was good, and, and I, I agree with uh, Dick's comments. And, um, you know, it's just that this was a tough approval process for us. Yes. That, that's where I was coming from, more, more so. And, and so I agree with everything that Dick had said, and, you know, I'm, I'm actually for it. Yeah, it's 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 a, a fourteen hundred square feet is is nothing. So, well, especially when it's more than offset. Yes, it's essentially a, a plus sixty two in in favor of non impervious. All right, so we have kind time of for a vote. Heard from everyone, yep. Then we'll, we'll call for a vote on the motion as presented. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay. Anyone abstaining? Okay. So with no opposition and no abstaining, we've got a unanimous decision. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So minutes will reflect the decision and then I'll consult with town staff upon his return to see about the letter, you know, or how, how that is appropriately conveyed to planning and zoning. Okay. Right. Thank you. Should be brief. <laughs> One can only hope. <laughs> yes, and it will not alter any conditions that were in our original approval. <laughs> so, hey, 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 I want to commend Jack on adding that condition eight. We ought to think about that a lot when we do uh, applications that have issues, you know, that might come up if somebody were to change a little bit. Yeah. It, it's yeah, kind of a catch all. We do it too tomorrow. much, though. Yeah, I was going to say, we, 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 if you catch 20, we get everyone back, probably, you know, don't want that either, but. Uh, yeah, we don't want people to have to be coming here every time they um, have a very slight change in. Um, I, I agree. Construction work. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can, we can think through, you know, well, guidelines and, and work with our, our, our town staff about what's sensitive and what isn't when we're looking at a particular application and put it in, you know, tailored. Hey, when we do the regs over, Barb, we ought to look at 7.6. Yeah, I mean, we can make a little star there. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Add a little more info or teeth to it or something. Yes. All right. Okay, we have other business. There's election of officers on there, and then we have an open space consideration that I need to bring back up. So please don't let us sign off without the second edition to other. All right. Okay, with regard to election of officers, Jack, you're move lighting to, up. Move to, um nominate Barbara Kelly for chair. Second. I third it. Right. All right. No nominations from the floor, no anything. All right, I heard a nomination. Um, we want to vote on that nomination or then vote at the end about the whole slate. Vote separately? Might yes. as well vote separate. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Abstaining. Okay. One more year. <laughs> you, you wish more than that. <laughs> All right. Is there any nomination for vice chair? I nominate Jack Phillips for vice chair. Second. Second. All right. So we've had a motion and a second. Um, any other nominations? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? We have a vice chair. 
right? Now we, we need the secretary. Nominate Adam for secretary, assuming you still want it. Why not? Second. Is it, he has accepted the nomination. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay. Any other nominations? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. Okay, again, a unanimous election. All right. The other bit of um, other business, I got calls today. Back when Betty resigned from the Open Space Task Force, I know she had approached me and folks had approached me about filling in as being the representative from wetlands. I think, I believe I mentioned it at a meeting for discussion. At that point, I informally threw it out there to say if anyone else would like to join the other commission. There were no takers at that time. And so it was more our last. I think that's a fair representation of what happened. Um, but now um, the mayor is asking for a more, they did appoint me, but now they would like a more formal vote from the commission designating the representative from wetlands to the open space task force. Before we can act on that, we'd better vote it onto the agenda. So move to add a discussion and vote of a nominee for open space task force to the agenda. Second. Okay. Should have probably done that at the beginning. Good catch, Jack. Add to agenda. Okay, is now we'll vote on that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. Okay. All right. So now we have the topic. There's another opportunity for someone to step forward, or we can have a vote. Well, unless you object to it, um, I move we. Um, appoint Barbara Kelly as the Inland Wetlands Agency Conservation Commission representative. Second. You, Second. Get, the, you get the time, Barb. So far, yes. <laughs> okay. They canceled can the always, January. Eight, they eight, canceled eight. the December and January meeting, so I can handle it. But I also think <laughs> I think it does relate a lot, you know. No, you'd be perfect some of the for things, it. To some of the things we do here, and and I guess I kind of filled Betty's shoes also on the agricultural land preservation, so it kind of tails in nicely. Although it would be good at times that we may want some someone else to fill in there, so think about it. All right. Okay, so there was a second. This okay. discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, so the, that was unanimous. So the minutes need to reflect it. That was that was the concern that they wanted the minutes to reflect that decision. So we now have done that. All right. Then we have application received. So it looks like we will be having a meeting in a couple weeks. So. There we go. Okay. <laughs> now we're on to the final agenda item. Move motion to adjourn. to adjourn. Second. All right. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Goodbye. See Thank ya. you all. Thank you all very much. <laughs> you have a good evening. Yeah. Yeah. Good night.